Uh, good evening, Professor John Pratt um, from the Institute of uh, Criminology at Victoria University. Um, tonight at the Anglican Chaplaincy at the Do Something Seminar, you outlined that the correction system is a fundamental area of governance in modern society. And you also stated that every dollar that is put into prisons is a dollar less for welfare. You showed us a graph which illustrated to what extent English-speaking countries have a higher imprisonment rate compared to Scandinavian countries, which leads to the research you are currently working on. Why is there such a disparity? Uh -huh. Yeah, you're right. I, I said that uh, every dollar spent on prisons is a dollar less for education health and social welfare. Why is there such a disparity? Well, you're a little bit premature in, uh, because it's, it's research that's only been going a relatively short time. But uh, one of the reasons is that law and order issues and, uh, and uh, punishment of crime hasn't been politicized in the way it has uh, in the Anglophone countries. In the Scandinavian countries, uh, the, the, the media tends to be non-sensational. Uh, there tends to be a broad degree of political consensus uh, and um, they are happy to let uh, expert opinion continue to drive penal policy in those countries. So th that's just a kind of description of differences there. Why is it that you do get those kinds of differences? Why is the media non-sensational in Scandinavia, but it is here? Why is it that experts have a much higher place in Scandinavia than they seem to do here? Well, you're talking about deep-seated sociological explanations. And I think that uh, to a large extent, uh, you have to look back to the development of very egalitarian cultures in the Scandinavian societies uh, where um, high levels of equality amongst very homogenous societies uh, based around trying to get people to improve themselves with the help of the local community. Um, became a feature of those societies. At the same time, there was a very uh, high importance given to education in the Scandinavian countries, right from the 19th century, with the impact of the Lutheran Church, preparing people for confirmation, and the, the priests were very central figures in uh, the small Scandinavian communities towards the end of the 19th century, they were largely replaced by school teachers. But again, you can see the, the, the emphasis and the prominence of education in, in, in Scandinavia. So ra rather different um, cultural histories from what we find in the Anglophone world. I mean, certainly England. Uh, you, you get a society from the 19th century onward that was very much more stratified and divided by class uh, all the way down. Even amongst the poorest people in English society, you had the respectable poor, then you had people in the workhouses, then you had the mentally ill, and then right at the bottom of the list, you had the prisoners, and they're completely different from Scandinavia. To a certain extent, of course, it was inevitable that that kind of culture would be exported to New Zealand and Australia, although it was mediated as well by a rather different social conditions here. Australia and New Zealand are much more egalitarian than England. There's no doubt at all about that. But I mean, I think there are local differences as well that help to develop a much more punitive culture in these societies than what we find in Scandinavia. In Australia, I think there's been a historical difference, uh, historical suspicion of people with criminal backgrounds uh, in a bid to try and rid itself of the, of the criminal taint that was associated with transportation. In New Zealand, I think that the idea about colonization was that you would set up this wonderful, pristine uh, society in the South Pacific, like Britain, but free of all the social problems. Well, the more perfect you try and make a society, the more punitive and intolerant uh, it becomes. Equally, in all three Anglophone societies, you get far less value given to education. Yeah? Australia and New Zealand, or they didn't need 
poets and artists, when they were colonizing the place, they needed strong men who could cut down trees and do farming and things like that. In England, uh, it was thought that, well, if you, why, why bother to educate the working classes? Uh, they might get ideas above their station. And education for the rich was very much a kind of part of social etiquette as, as much as cramming knowledge into their heads. So education as well uh, was seen in very different ways in these societies. I think post-1945, these differences came to be solidified with the development of two very different models of welfare state. And that's another of the, the kind of hypotheses I'm working on the thesis. The Scandinavian welfare state uh, has, uh, based on universal rights, uh, and is designed to make sure that the welfare state maintains your standard of living, yes? So that if you lose your job in Scandinavia, you get earnings related unemployment benefit, right? If you don't immediately drop down to subsistence level, which would what be what happens in the Anglophone world. Again, because everybody benefits from the welfare state in Scandinavia, whether it's through uh, free kindergartens for children, free university education, free health care, generous benefits when you get to old age or earnings related benefit if you become unemployed it, 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 it builds in faith in the welfare state and helps to bring about solidarity within those societies so, so, so many of the anxieties that we have in New Zealand today are removed by having this, this very inclusive welfare state where risk and insecurity is, is greatly reduced. Uh, whereas in, in, in the Anglophone world, the welfare state developed as nothing more than a safety net. And of course, there's always so much suspicion and intolerance of, uh, of people who were bludging and uh, and getting something that they didn't deserve and so on. It, it, in, in fact, that you can argue that w although it did lots of good things, of course, the welfare state, it helped to increase division and tension and suspicion. So, I mean, if, if you're looking for explanations of these differences, I think they're to be found in these long-standing cultural values of equality and, second, the way in which they were solidified and institutionalized through the post-war development of the differing models of welfare state in these societies. And also increasing levels in family violence. Um, most of the violence occurred in the last three years when the police began making family violence an arrestable offence. Um, these are also largely due to changing practices and the 99 uh, referendum which stated that 91.7 per cent um, wanted harsher sentences. Scandinavian countries have an opposite view. Um, why is penal policy heavily influenced by politics in New Zealand? Well, because it's seen, I think, as a, an easy answer to all our anxieties and insecurities, and because, as well, we have a very sensationalised media, we don't have a very well-informed media, uh, it, it's expressed in very simplistic terms. Um, and, and of course, uh, when the public as well have so little faith in politicians, then one way to try and restore that faith for politicians is to come out with these very populist messages that oh, we're going to tackle the biggest problem in New Zealand, it's all these dangerous criminals, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was the message that was in the referendum. But of course, the reality, crime is rather different. Uh, crime overall in New Zealand has stabilised, to a certain extent it's gone down. There have been claims that violence has increased, but I mean, most of the increase in violence in the last three or four years has simply been because of changes in police practice towards domestic violence. I don't think there's been any real increase in violence. Certainly nothing to justify the, the, the growth in imprisonment that we've had in this society. Um, you also outlined um, some of the prison conditions which are, which are quite contrary to uh, what the New Zealand public often hear. Mm -hmm. How can the public perceptions be changed? 
I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. It's it's so hard uh, because our journalists tend not to be specialists in issues like crime and punishment, uh, so that they simply don't know the subject area. Uh, they don't even know what questions to ask about it often when, when you do get interviewed. I really don't know. Uh, I, I, I think it's incumbent on people who are interested to try and do something themselves, whether it's writing to their MPs, or writing letters to the paper, or f starting to get involved in talk back themselves, uh, rather than allowing that to be the kind of um, uh, home of uh, certain redneck elements that it has a reputation for. Thank you very much for your time. Right. Thank you.